Uh, I don't know if you've ever been at one of those rugby or football matches on the last day of the season when the fans and the crowd are watching one match, but they're also listening on radios to find out the results of other matches because they can have an impact on where they finish uh, in the league table. And more importantly, whether they get relegated or promoted. And even if their own team is getting beaten, you can actually hear cheers from them and applause because of something that's happening in another ground many miles away. And there's something to be said about being plugged into something that's happening and going on elsewhere. You see, sometimes in life, the things that are going on where we are become very difficult. So as Paul writes these words from Romans chapter 8 that we're just about to hear read to us, he wants us to make sure that our faith in God affects the perspective in which we view our current circumstances. No matter how difficult or even desperate those situations seem, Paul says we can face it with hope. Elkie's going to come and bring us our reading now. God into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what is already has? But if we hope for what we are what we are do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Elke. Uh, for a few weeks now we've been working through uh, Romans chapter eight. Um, this letter of the Apostle Paul to the Romans. And so far we've highlighted that we live our lives in the middle of God's grace and that there's no condemnation for our sin if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. We also focus on the fact that God gives us a companion in the Holy Spirit who helps us live life to the full. And this week, it's the gift of hope that Paul is pointing towards. The fact that we always have hope is a tremendous benefit of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Uh, in the world today, you don't have to look far to notice that people struggle with hopelessness. If you talk to a number of people for any length of time, quite often the conversation gets round to the fact that they're discouraged about something. Or just look at their uh, social media posts and you'll find that there's something that they're moaning or complaining about. Listen to any of the talk shows on TV or the radio stations and you'll find people who are very cynical about life. They think the world is going down the pan. And on a world scale, we go from crisis to crisis. Think of the conflicts, the wars, the civil unrest, the acts of terrorism that have been happening around the world over the last number of years and right now we witness the ravages of war in the Ukraine hospitals bombed people fleeing to safety and in spite of our best efforts we know that there will be more conflicts to come and then there's the economic crisis happening all over the world affecting so many countries many being plunged currently into fuel poverty because of the rising energy prices and of course, not all our struggles are national or international. In our personal lives, there's pain. We have physical problems that affect our bodies. We endure emotional turmoil that comes from maybe losing a loved one or that comes when we are disappointed by someone we love. If we're honest, we have to admit that sometimes we can even have spiritual struggles. There's times that we may feel disappointed with God. As Paul talks about, this life that we live. He doesn't want us to candy coat the pain and the struggles that we go through. But what he wants us to do is to put them into perspective. 
Look again at verse 18 of the passage that Alki read to us. It says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. Paul uses language that helps us see life in this eternal proposition. We live here on earth for a little while, but we live in, eter for, in eternity in God's presence for eternity. Paul wants us to make sure, or what Paul wants us to make sure of, is that we don't get discouraged with the difficulties of life that we face now, and in so doing that we lose sight of the eternal big picture. He says, don't forget there will be a time when there'll be, there won't be any more struggles, pain, death, or tears. For those who are in Christ, there will only be joy and happiness. And then look what he says in verse 19 to 21. He says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looked forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. The truth of the matter is that right now we live in a world that's less than perfect. This world is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. That law states that everything in the universe is decaying. What seems fresh and new one day will soon be old and broken down. Something that's growing and vibrant will one day shrivel up and die. To use Paul's language in this passage, the world is in bondage to decay. So the plant that pops up through the soil and looks so alive and fresh will one day rot and die. Now here's a tip for you. If you want to speed that process up, pop that plant up, give it to me, because that's a guarantee of a death sentence for it. But seriously, the, the reality of our situation is that everything on earth is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. And even those of you that have great green fingers can't make every plant live forever. Every living thing will eventually die, and that includes you and me. And so the second law of thermodynamics doesn't offer any hope for, uh, on any hope for anything on this earth. And when you run smack bang into that truth, then it's quite sobering. In the last century, there was a philosopher called Bertrand Russell. He was a, an outspoken atheist. He even wrote a book called Why I'm Not a Christian. When Russell was 81 years old, he was interviewed on a BBC radio uh, chat show. The interviewer asked him what he had to hang on to when death was obviously so close. Russell responded, I have nothing to hang on to but grim and unyielding despair. What an honest and yet so hopeless a response. You see, when you live only for this life, when you invest your life in the flesh, when you think that, that this is all that there is, you can't help but live in despair. But though, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, there is hope because we anticipate a time when death and decay will no longer exist. In verse 19, Paul says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. That, that phrase, eager expectation, is a picturesque word that means to, to stretch the neck in anticipation. I don't know if you've ever waited for someone to arrive at an airport, and as people come through the arrivals gate, you're sort of stretching and looking, trying to get a glimpse of the person that you're waiting for. And Paul says creation is in that type of existence, longing to see what God is going to do. And I believe it. Just look at what Paul goes on to say in the next verse, 22. He says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait, wait with eager hope. For the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. 
I've been around people who've grown outwardly because of the pain that their bodies are racked with. And it's not easy listening. But I've also been around people who, who've grown inwardly too. It might, be, it might not be an audible groan, but more an internal groan in a sense of a longing for perfection. In Paul's mind, the groan occurs when we realise that there's a huge gap between what is and what ought to be. Every one of us probably has been there. Sometimes it moves us to tears. We cry for the situations that we see the world in. When we experience the fullness of the world, we let out this groan. Maybe it's when a friend or a child or a parent or someone we love who does something we wish they wouldn't have done or we know they shouldn't have done and we, we groan out of frustration. Maybe it's when circumstances arise that cause us or someone we love to be in pain and out of pity we groan. But Paul says that groaning is a sign of our hope. We're longing for something better. And if we're in Christ, we have that promise that there is something better. And so as we groan, we remember our hope. Someday things will be better. We have hope. And that hope for the future can and should affect our present disposition. You see, the biblical worldview points points us to a hope that's greater than the world that we live in currently. Just as Paul said in Romans chapter 8 that we need to live in the spirit rather than in the flesh, he also reminds us in these verses that we should be in touch with a, an eternal perspective of life, that something that's greater than the world in which we live in. If we are in Christ, then we've been infused with an eternal sense of hopefulness, for the Christian, there's no such thing as a hopeless situation. Because Paul reminds us in verse 24 that we were given this hope when we were saved. He goes on to say, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Paul expands on this a little bit more in 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 6, or chapter 4, verse 16, when he writes, Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly, outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that vastly outweighs them. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now make sure that you understand what God is teaching us here through, through Paul's words. He's not saying like some religious cults would say that we should deny the reality of pain and trouble in this world because it's not real. That's not it at all. That's not what he's saying to us. You see, the world does hurt. It is frustrated and painful and we shouldn't deny that pain. But we cannot let that hopelessness of this creation get us down. For the Christian who has entrusted his or her life to Jesus, then there's always reason for hope, both in this life and in the life to come. Now, given that eternal perspective, there is more that there's more to life than the physical world. Let me show you two ways that a Christian's hope for the future should change our perspective here and now. Firstly, our hope keeps us from settling for the things of this world. Our hope should stop us from settling for the things of this world. You see, we live in a society that's bought the lie that stuff will provide happiness. Even with the economic downturn, we still live in a time of unprecedented prosperity. There's this idea floating around that if you gather enough stuff, you'll experience fulfillment. That stuff could be power, it could be prestige, it could be possessions, it could be relationships. But if you're astute enough to look around at people who have those things, then you'll notice a, tr a trend that fulfillment doesn't come from the amount of stuff that you have. One writer put it this way, 
They said, never in history have so many had so much for so long and been so depressed about it. But you see, when we adopt this eternal mindset, stuff loses its significance. We re when we recognize that the things of the world aren't going to last forever, then we realize that there's no fulfillment in collecting it. We come to realize what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He said to the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. When we, play, when we place our hope in God, we don't try to satisfy our groanings with the things of the world. Rather, in hope, we anticipate that God will satisfy us in ways that we cannot understand in this lifetime. Listen to those verses from 24 to 25 again. It says, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But we look forward to something we don't yet have. We must wait patiently and confidently. So as a Christian, our hope for the future should change our present. Firstly, because our hope keeps us from settling for the things of the world. But secondly, our hope turns our eyes away from our pain and to God's glory. Time and again, when we or other Christians experience, experience suffering or tragedy, we often hear testimony of how God used it for his glory. This was a truth that Paul expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. See, God fills us up through the comfort of others. And then we may find ourselves in situations where God can use us to play that forward and to use our experience to comfort others in need. Maybe because we've experienced something similar to a situation that this other person finds themselves in. But God can use us to bring comfort to others. But more importantly, we can also share hope, that hope that we read about in verse 21. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. You see, the good news is that in Jesus we live in a state of hope that the pain of this world will give way to the painless reality of heaven. The promise from the Bible is that at that time Jesus will dry all our tears. And that isn't, as some say, uh, pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. Rather, as Christians, it should infuse our life now with the ability to turn our eyes away from our pain and turn it towards God's glory. The good news for those of us who are in Christ Jesus is that you always, always have hope. So what about us here this morning and, and those on Zoom? Are you in a place currently where you sense that you have no hope? Maybe you even feel let down by God. Or do you fear death or are you in the opposite camp where you eagerly await what eternity holds in store for you? For a Christian there should be no fear of death. And as you look around the world, what is it that causes you to groan inwardly? Is it people trafficking? Is it the war in Ukraine? Is it sex crimes? Is it injustice? Maybe you, as I've just been sharing, you feel that you've got so bogged down with the stuff of life that you've lost the anticipation of what God has in store for you. Or maybe this morning you feel prompted that you can use your life experiences to bring hope and comfort to others. Whatever God's saying to you this morning, whatever situation you find yourself in, don't ignore it. Respond and act upon what God's prompting you to do. And if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling without hope, then come to the foot of the cross and leave your burdens there. Leave them for Jesus to deal with. 
and experience the hope and the love and the grace that he offers to each one of us. Receive the hope that he wants to bring in the place of your frustrations, your doubts, your troubles and your pain. There is opportunity for prayer at the end of the service for anyone who just wants to pray through what God might be saying to you. But as we prepare to meet around the Lord's table, let's just pray now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our living hope and that your grace is sufficient for each one of us. Thank you that you offer us life and life in all its fullness and the promise of an eternity with you will vastly surpass all our wildest dreams. Come Holy Spirit, come and move among us both here and wherever we are joining on Zoom. Help us to let go of those things that hold us back. Our frustrations, our, our love of stuff, our fear of death, Renew our hope, challenge us, change us, free us and transform us so that we would be people who live lives who in turn can bring hope and comfort to others and bring glory to your name. Amen.